Welcome, everybody, to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday Night Edition. It's our great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Kelly Malloy. She got her optometry degree at Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where she also did a residency uh, in the Eye Institute, and she did a fellowship in neuro-ophthalmic disease. Currently, she's chief of the neuro-ophthalmic disease at the Eye Institute at Pennsylvania College of Optometry, Salish University. She also teaches a course in neuro-ophthalmic disease and neuroanatomy. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, and she is a diplomate uh, at the academy level in neuro-ophthalmic disease. So with it, it's really our great pleasure to uh, bring back Dr. Kelly Malloy to talk about neuro-ophthalmic disease cases, part two. She had so much good material that we just couldn't leave it on the table. We had to go back and do it again. Kelly, you Thank can take you over, so please. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Glad to be back. And we're just going to jump right into some cases. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. And Joe and Greg will let me know your questions and we can discuss them. I first want to say that I am a consultant and speaker for Osmotica Pharmaceuticals and RVL Pharmaceuticals, but that has no association with me in the lecture today. So we're going to jump right into case number one. And this is a 76-year-old woman. And you can probably imagine by looking at her that she comes in complaining of double vision. It's new onset, double vision. Uh, and she also says that maybe she feels her lid is a little bit droopy as well, but she's mainly concerned that she's seen two of everything and she feels like she constantly has to close an eye in order to function. And you can see her health history there, uh, arthritis, she has osteoporosis, she just has some acid reflux, as you see there indicated by GERD but she denies any diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Because when you see somebody with new onset double vision, probably one of the first things you think of is, is it vasculopathic, right? So she denies any vasculopathic risk factors. Of course, she is 76 years old and we don't know yet, I haven't told you yet, you know, when she last was to a doctor. So maybe she does undiagnosed conditions, but at least that's not gonna be something you're gonna say, oh, so slam dunk, this is vasculopathic. You're really gonna have to think about what's going on. You can see uh, she's medicated for the conditions that I just mentioned. But we do her exam and her afferent exam is unremarkable. As you can see, she has good visual function in both eyes. She has no proptosis as well. As you can see, she's symmetric there at 20 millimeters each eye and there her blood pressure is and it's good, right? Mm -hmm. So again, less likely thinking something vasculopathic at this point. The ocular health assessment is also normal. So we have to jump in to really look at the efferent exam because that's where we really are concerned with her. So we take a look at her motilities and you can see that both eyes do not adduct really much at all. Um, the left eye adducts maybe a little bit more than the right eye, but she has significant bilateral adduction deficit. So at this point, we have to think about what our differential diagnosis would be. And just to confirm how much we said in terms of ductional limitation, you can see she didn't really adduct at all, as I said here in um, that right eye, then the left eye a little bit more so at 30% of normal. And when we look at the cover test results here, you can see that, I mean, I had to get two prism bars out to really fully measure the extent of this exodeviation. So this is really sick. Her eyes are just pointing outward. Um, so we'd never be able to Say, oh, we're going to give you prism to help you line up your images. That's never going to work. So really, we're going to have to occlude an eye, and that's really the only treatment we're going to be able to do right away while we're trying to figure out what is going on with her. So our differential diagnosis for this presentation is here. Now, anytime somebody has a complaint of double vision, you always have to include in your differential myasthenia gravis and thyroid eye disease. They can cause any type of double vision. They can cause horizontal diplopia, vertical diplopia, um, diagonal diplopia. So they always have to be on the list. Another thing that also has to be considered in someone over the age of 50 when they have any new onset afferent or efferent problem is giant cell arteritis. So that is another consideration. And then of course, uh, we have to consider with an adduction deficit specifically, a third nerve palsy, as well as an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And that would be a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia because both eyes don't adduct. And when we think about that, uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, whether it be unilateral or bilateral, it tends to be most common in 
young people with uh, multiple sclerosis or if in older people from stroke. So in this patient with her age, we, if she does have that, we'd be thinking it's more likely a stroke. So those are the things we are considering at this point. But which of these would be least likely in this patient? And you could think of, you know, well, she doesn't have vasculopathic risk factors. So, you know, I wouldn't really be thinking a third nerve palsy, but we have to remember there's other reasons for a three. And if this is a three, remember she's a bilateral adduction deficit. So this would have to be a bilateral third nerve palsy. Um, and that would be least likely to be a vasculopathic process. So if it was a bilateral three, we'd be thinking something of vasculopathic anyway. But in terms of which is least likely for the sole purpose of having a bilateral adduction deficit without really any other limitation of ductions, the other ones were pretty good for the most part. And the least is gonna be thyroid eye disease to have solely an adduction deficit. Because with thyroid eye disease, there are certain muscles that are more likely to be affected first. When I say affected, I mean infiltrated. With thyroid eye disease, we get enlargement of the muscle bellies. And the most common to be affected is the inferior rectus muscle, followed by the medial rectus and then the superior rectus muscle. And you might be thinking, well, there's an adduction deficit. And you just said medial rectus was the second most common muscle. But we have to remember with thyroid eye disease, it's not that the muscle is damaged and not working, it's that the muscle is too big. So the reason you get adductional limitation with thyroid eye disease is because the back of the globe is turning into that large belly of the muscle. So where the front of the eye is going, so if the front of the eye is adducting, the back of the eye is going out or toward the ear. So we have to keep that in mind that it wouldn't be a medial rectus that's involved from thyroid eye disease, if there's an adduction deficit, it would actually be a lateral rectus muscle that is enlarged. So it would be very odd to not have an inferior medial or superior rectus involvement. And by that, I mean from inferior rectus, problems looking up, from medial rectus, problems looking out, and from superior rectus, problems looking down. To not have any of those, but to have an adduction deficit from a lateral rectus problem and yet bilaterally would be very, very uh, unusual. So we could cross that one off the list first. In terms of uh, these other ones that are left for consideration, and we're also gonna have to decide how concerned are we? And is her presentation potentially a medical emergency? Now of the conditions we have left, as I said, giant cell arteritis is in the consideration and both a bilateral third nerve palsy, as well as an internuclear ophthalmoplegia with ischemic deviation could be from giant cell arteritis. Because I said bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia with ischemic deviation could be from a stroke in someone of this age. And we know giant cell arteritis can cause stroke. It is definitely a risk factor for stroke. Uh, so those things all have to be considered. So if giant cell arteritis is still a consideration, that would make this potentially a medical emergency. And if stroke is a consideration, be it from GCA or not, uh, that would also be a medical emergency if this was an acute presentation. So things to consider at this point as we continue to go through our exam and try to really tailor down which of these diagnoses we're most concerned about. So with that in mind, we're thinking, okay, is this a bino? Is this a bilateral three? How would we then explain the ptosis if it was a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia and a skew deviation? And you know, the, the answer is we really don't. We wouldn't have a ptosis from the same lesion. So we ask the patient more questions of what could be going on. Because remember, uh, an internuclear ophthalmoplegia is going to be a problem specifically in the dorsal part of the brain stem, the um, MLF or the medial longitudinal fasciculus. And that functions uh, in terms of moving of the uh, eyes or eye movements, but it wouldn't really cause ptosis with an INO. So we have to ask the patient other questions for that other differential that remained in our list, which was myasthenia gravis. So as we know, patients with myasthenia gravis, they can have weakness of all voluntary muscles. So not only the muscles of the eyes in terms of the vascularis oculi muscle, which would give us the ptosis if that's weak, 
or the extra ocular muscles, which can give us the phobia, but they can have weakness of other voluntary muscles if it's generalized myasthenia gravis. And therefore we have to ask about any weakness of the arms or legs, for instance. We have to ask about any difficulty breathing or swallowing. And although she denied breathing difficulties and weakness, she did then admit once we started asking her these questions that, oh yeah, now that you mention it for the last six months, I feel like I've had some difficulty swallowing. And I have scheduled an appointment with an ear, nose, and throat doctor, um, and I have choked on some food recently. So that brings myasthenia gravis higher up on our differential list, and it makes a bilateral pyramidal palsy uh, less likely. And if myasthenia is becoming our leading differential, myasthenia is not caused from giant cell arteritis, and therefore that is not uh, as high on the list now either. So now we're really going to head in the direction of myasthenia once we've gotten to this point in our exam that we feel strongly that this is the leading differential. So we have to do more in-office tests to help prove that, yes, we really do think this could be giant cell arteritis. And the tests we're going to look at are fatigue. We know that myasthenia gravis is something that is fatigable. And then we also know it's something that improves with cold temperatures. So we would do an ice pack test and we're gonna look for any specific weakness of the eyes uh, and a few additional tests as well. So these are the tests that we're gonna look for and how they're going to uh, present. So we are gonna have weakness of the bicularis oculi muscle. We're gonna look for improvement with rest um, and fatigability. So let's look in. So here we have looking at their bicularis function. And if we look at this top picture here, we ask the patient, squeeze your eyes as tightly as you can. And first, they're not gonna really squeeze them all the way, they just think they have to close their eyes. You're gonna say, no, I want you to pretend I'm gonna put soap in your eyes and it's gonna burn. I want you to squeeze them as tight as you can and don't let me pry them open. And then when they really squeeze as tightly as they can, if they have normal bicularis function, you should not be able to pry their eyelids open. But you can see, especially in the left eye, we're able to do that a little bit in the right, but more so in the left, that we're actually seeing some sclera there. We should not be able to do that. So there was weakness uh, bilaterally, but more so on the left, which does give us a little bit more uh, proof that this probably is myasthenia gravis. And now we're going to do a few more tests. We're going to check for fatigability. Now you can check fatigue of the eyelids, which we're going to do here. I'm going to show you here. But you can also check fatigue of the extraocular muscles. In order to do that, you're going to have the patient, usually have the patient look back and forth 100 times and then up and down 100 times, just trying to tire out the extracular muscles. And then you would have to do your cover test, your ductions and your cover test again and see if the pattern worsened uh, and if the magnitude of your cover test worsened, and that would prove fatigability. But with eyelids, as we see here, you have the patient look up for two minutes. And during that two minutes, you watch. And if they really are fatigable during the two minutes, as happened in this case, the patient's still trying to look up and the eyelid just falls down. You just see it gradually fall down. And that's a positive fatigue test. In some people, during the two minutes, they're looking up, their eyelids stay up so they don't get that drooping, dropping of the lid. But then what you do is you measure. So you, would have, you want to have done a pre-fatigue measurement where you measure the palpebral apertures, having the patient look at distance, and keeping in mind that you, anytime you're measuring the palpebral aperture, you really want to hold that frontalis down. So you put your hand on their forehead and push down a bit so that they can't use that frontalis muscle because someone who has ptosis naturally is going to want to see better. They don't want their eyelids to block their visual axis. So they lift their eyelids up using their frontalis muscle. So you want to kind of stop them being able to use that and kind of push a little bit of pressure downward. So you did the measurement before the two minutes of up gaze. And if during the two minutes they, their eyelid didn't start to fall down, you still can see if they have fatigue. And you do that by having them again look at the same target. It has to be the same target at distance. Because if you just say look far away, they could look higher or lower, which would change their palpebral aperture. So they look at the same target. And now you again hold the frontalis and measure the aperture. A positive test is a change in two millimeters. So it's the rule of twos when we talk about this myasthenia testing. You're going to do it for two minutes looking up, and it's a positive test if the apertures change by a factor of two millimeters. In her case, obvious fatigability. 
And then another test that's going to be helpful to see if this really is my ischemia gravis or if that's your biggest differential at this point is seeing if there is improvement with ice. Because we know with myasthenia gravis, this is a problem at the neuromuscular junction. And we know at the neuromuscular junction, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. And we normally have acetylcholine being produced and we have acetylcholinesterase that's going to break down the acetylcholine. But with myasthenia gravis, you have um, antibodies that bind to the receptors. So even if you have acetylcholine, there's not enough uh, receptors there to bind to. So the, what happens is cold stops acetylcholinesterase from breaking down acetylcholine, and it keeps more acetylcholine there at the nerve terminal. So anytime a receptor becomes available, there's enough acetylcholine there to bind to it. So we see improvement of muscle function when temperatures decrease. With that in mind, so you're going to have the patient now just close their eyes. I tell them you're going to the spa now. Just close your eyes and I'm going to put an ice pack. I want to make sure it's, it's very cold and it's pliable because if you get some hard piece of ice, right, um, something that doesn't bend like a, like a plastic ice pack, for instance, those hard ones, and you just say, okay, put this on your eyes, it's going to pretty much hit their eyebrows and their cheekbones and their eyelids are not going to be cold. We need the cold to be on the eyelids. Um, so something flexible that they can hold on their eyelids. Usually I wrap a tissue around it and oftentimes I'm gonna have them hold it, making sure they're putting it so that it's touching their eyelids. And sometimes it gets a little cold to the touch after a few minutes and to the eyelid skin as well. So wrapping it in a tissue, having that on for two minutes. And afterwards, I'm gonna again, have them look at the same distance, the same target, measure their palpebral apertures. If they increase now after two minutes by two millimeters, that is also a positive test and more indicative of myasthenia gravis. So these three tests we did, all three of them were suggestive of myasthenia gravis in this case. So because of that, that is our leading diagnosis. We are not so concerned about those other initial differentials. And we really want to confirm, does this patient have myasthenia gravis so that she can then be treated? And these are all now the blood tests, which are the initial testing that's going to be done for myasthenia gravis. You're going to start with blood tests. The ones that are in the bright red there, which are all types of acetylcholine receptor antibodies that I was mentioning, they're going to be the first line tests. Okay, so you're going to do those first. The other three that are kind of in that maroon color, they are less likely to be positive, um, but are needed in some cases. So you kind of save those on the back burner if you do the acetylcholine receptor antibodies, if none come out positive and you really are still thinking this is myasthenia, then you can order those additionally. So again, first line tests are gonna be these acetylcholine receptor antibodies. There are three, they're binding, blocking, and modulating. Now, depending on the lab that the patient goes to, they may do all three, some labs do, some labs do not do the modulating. Um, so, if you were gonna get any, uh, the binding and blocking do give you the highest yield. Actually, you had to just pick one. And in some cases I've had to when patients didn't have insurance. Uh, and I said, all right, well, I'm just gonna try one first because you have to pay for this out of pocket. And if that was the case, I would pick the binding antibody because it does have the most yield. So a patient is considered seropositive if you do this blood test and it came, comes back positive. It means in the blood, in their serum, they have a positive antibody for myasthenia gravis. And then they're considered seronegative if it is negative. So someone can have myasthenia gravis, but the tests come out normal. At that point, you can't confirm they have myasthenia gravis. You have to still keep searching. Um, and if it is generalized myasthenia, where it affects other parts of the body besides just the eyes, it is more likely that the labs will come out positive. Now, in our patient, if you remember, she was having some difficulty swallowing. Uh, if that's all related, this would then be generalized myasthenia. So you would think more likely that she is going to come back positive than if it was just purely her eyelids and her extraocular muscles. So again, binding is the most sensitive and most specific of the acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Um, and again, if you just had to pick one for some reason, if the patient did not have insurance, that would be the first one that you would try. Because the binding antibodies are present in about 85% of patients with generalized myasthenia, but only about 40 to 70% of patients with ocular myasthenia. 
keeping in mind that if you've done the labs for myasthenia and they come back negative, and we're gonna see there's other tests that we can do, um, but say everything comes back negative and you really are thinking this is myasthenia because they fatigue, they had the ice pack, they had the orbicularis oculi weakness, et cetera. You should retest them later down the road because somebody can convert to being seropositive for myasthenia gravis. All right, so we did this ketocholine receptor antibodies. We thought, all right, she, she has generalized, 85% of the time it's gonna come back positive, but hers, nope, came back negative. So all three were done and all three were negative. Like this really looks like myasthenia, right? Uh, she has all these in-office mm -hmm. tests that look consistent. So what do we do from here? But there are other blood tests that we can consider, as I mentioned. One of them is MUSC antibodies, and that stands for muscle-specific kinase antibodies, as you can see there. And this is going to be present uh, in people that are acetylcholine receptor, seronegative. Of those, if it's generalized, which our patient would be, potentially with the swallowing difficulties, 38 to 50% of those should be positive from MUSC antibodies. Okay? Um, so, that is definitely something to consider. And uh, patients who do have the musk antibody positivity, they also often do present with ptosis and diplopia as their presenting features. So ocular features are often their presenting features as was our patient in this case. All right, so when we talk about uh, people who are acetylcholine receptor negative, but musk antibody positive, one thing is it is more common in females but it's not associated with thymoma. So we know that patients who have myasthenia gravis, a certain percentage of those, and it varies depending on which source you read or which subcategory of myasthenia you're looking at, but roughly let's say between five and 20% of patients, of all patients with myasthenia have a thymoma, which is a mass of the thymus gland. And that could be related to the reason that they have myasthenia. And sometimes it winds up being the treatment if they have it removed. Um, but we know that those who are musk antibody positive, they do not have the associated thymoma. Mm -hmm. So it'd be probably less important if your patient came out to be musk positive uh, to get the scan of the thymus gland. And then another one is the LRP4 antibodies. Um, and this one also is uh, not associated with uh, thymoma. Okay, so found in um, about 10% of my senior that is seronegative for both acetylcholine receptors and musk. So you may want to do these in a stepwise fashion. You do your acetylcholines first. If that's negative, then you're going to get a musk. If that's negative, then you're going to get an LP4 antibody. And then lastly, there's striational antibodies. Uh, these are highly associated with thymoma. So if your patient is positive for the striational antibodies, you definitely have to make sure you're looking for the thymoma because about 80% of patients will have them. And some other diagnostic tests that have to be considered. One is gonna be imaging to look for that thymoma that we just mentioned. And also electrophysiology can be helpful. And uh, we'll talk about this in just a second. So the imaging, you could do either a CT or an MRI of the chest. And you'd be looking in the area of the thymus to see if there's a thymoma. As we said, roughly five to 20% of all my will have a thymoma. Keeping in mind that there's kind of a gray zone, right? You can have somebody that doesn't have any thymus abnormality at all. You can have somebody that has a thymoma, but then you have that in between where most of myasthenics fall, which is they have thymic hyperplasia. So the thymus gland is hyperplastic, but it's not technically a thymoma. Um, and then, you know, there's this decision does it get removed? Do they have a thymectomy? Anyone who has a thymoma is going gonna, gonna to be recommended that they have. Uh, but those with thymic hyperplasia, it, it is kind of a, you know, weighing the, the risks and benefits, the pros and cons. Okay? And again, but both a CAT scan or an MRI would be adequate at detecting thymoma. And again, we talked about the risk of thymoma based on which blood tests are positive. Um, so I'm not going to really go through that much again because I think I've talked about that enough. When we talk about electrophysiology that can be done, the type of electrophysiology that's gonna be important in myasthenia gravis is an EMG, and that stands for electromyogram. Now, keeping in mind that EMGs are pretty common in the neurology sector, but oftentimes these are done on big muscles of the body, the arm, the leg, et cetera. 
But if you have somebody, especially as eye doctors, that comes into us with ptosis and double vision, but they deny any generalized features of myasthenia, and you know, all your lab tests for myasthenia were negative, and you want to really tell, is this myasthenia? So you're trying to get an EMG. It has to be done on one of the muscles that's affected or in that proximity. So it either has to be a single fiber EMG of the apicularis oculi muscle or the frontalis muscle. Uh, and you don't find too many neurologists, that's who does a single fiber EMG, that specifically do them on the orbicularis oculi or the frontalis muscle. So it can be tough uh, because you don't want to just say, oh, I'm going to get an EMG on my patient and they do it on the arms or the legs, et cetera, because then you're going to get, you could potentially get false negatives, right? Because not, they're purely an ocular myasthenic, an arm EMG is not going to show you jitter. And jitter is variability in time of the second action potential compared to the first action potential. It's just like we said, with myasthenia gravis, people fatigue over time uh, when you're doing something like looking up or moving back and forth with your eyes, but also just when they're looking at the, as small as the action potential. So the action potential of the muscle fatigues over time as well. Uh, and they can see that with an EMG and it can be diagnostic. And keeping in mind that if, patients uh, get Botox injections around their eyes for any reason, um, it's going to affect the EMG. So it wouldn't be beneficial to order an EMG on these patients for up to a year uh, after they've had Botox in an animal. All right, but it may be hard to find uh, neurologists that do this specifically, but if you find one in your area, it can be very helpful. So you just have to specifically ask if they do this on um, the certain muscles, the frontalis and the bicularis oculi. If you live near any large uh, hospital-based medical centers, their neurology department would probably be the place to go. Uh, but it is positive in 93% of ocular myasthenics if it is done on the bicularis oculi or the frontalis muscles. So it can be a very helpful test. Now, if you say, well, I don't live in a place where I have a big medical center, I don't have the ability to do that. And that, that can happen. Uh, so what you can do sometimes, say this patient, we're thinking, oh, this is really myasthenia. We did the labs, they all came back negative, even those special ones, right? We did the uh, CT of the chest, there's no thymoma. What do we do now? Well, you can send to neurology and sometimes they just treat with mestinon, which is what we're gonna get into, the treatment for myasthenia gravis, to see. And if the patient gets better on the treatment, so the patient took mestinon and their ptosis got better, their diplopia got better, then that pretty much confirms that they had myasthenia gravis. So neurologists are willing to uh, just you know, treat with mestinon to see, uh, short of having a, a seropositive test. So in our case, though, the patient did have a single fiber EMG of the bicularis oculi muscle, and it was positive. So that confirmed the diagnosis of myasthenia. So the treatments, as we said, uh, they can be acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, which is what mestinone is. Sometimes they can use immunosuppressants like uh, steroids or NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Sometimes they have to use uh, just more rapid treatment if it's really something with bulbar issues where they're having problems swallowing or breathing, and they could use plasma exchange. That's PLEX stands for, they pretty much filter out all the antibodies, but they can use IV immunoglobulin treatment. And then surgical treatment, as I said, it would be a thymectomy. So this patient was treated with mestinon, which is the standard treatment for myasthenia. She was given 60 milligrams three times a day, but it didn't provide good relief of her symptoms. Uh, and that can happen sometimes. So then she was started on the immunosuppressant type route, as we did mention. So she was put on prednisone with a gradual increase in dosage over a few weeks. Um, this was all done by neurology, of course. And then she went up to a maximum 60 milligrams of prednisone every day. And then once her symptoms improved, her dosage was tapered. Now, I've been following her for a few years now, uh, and she's still on prednisone. She now takes it just every other day, just a low maintenance dose, uh, and she's doing very well. So she comes in on follow-up, and you can see on the steroids, look, her ptosis is gone. Her adduction deficits are much improved, if not close to normal. But now you'll see, um, make it a little bit, well, it's gonna make it a little bit bigger for you here. Let's go to here. She has a few styes now on her eye. And we're gonna have to think about what that could mean. 
And if you say, okay, well, she has you know, Shalazia, Hordiola, you're going to look and see what, what she has. Now, potentially, did the steroid have anything to do with that? That's a question, but you're going to need to manage what's going on with her eyelid. And you may say, well, I'm going to put her on an antibiotic. We have to keep in mind that we have to be very careful about what we prescribe um, for myasthenics. Not just what we prescribe, but what anyone prescribes. And you'd be surprised how many times patients have myasthenia and they're being followed by neurology and their primary care doctor and whatnot, but nobody's ever had a conversation with them about there are medications that could make your myasthenia worse. Uh, and potentially you could go into a myasthenic crisis. They really need to know about it. There's so something I wanted to share with all of you. Uh, maybe you can take a picture of this or something. This link at the top is from the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, and it's uh, a list of cautionary jug drugs for myasthenia. Now, you may not see a lot of myasthenics, uh, but still, if you keep this, just a few of these printed in your office, if you ever see a patient with myasthenia, it's going to be helpful for you of what you can give them. Uh, again, you might not be treating them, seeing them for the myasthenia, but they might come to you for a red eye or, you know, uh, an eyelid problem or, or something that you do have to treat, that you have to know what is safe to give them. And I always give a copy of this to my patients with my senior uh, and tell them to keep it with them because sometimes people forget and they may be prescribed something that is not good for them to take. So if we were considering that we had to prescribe an antibiotic for this patient, you can see that there are a lot of antibiotics that are contraindicated and should be used cautiously or maybe not at all. So the fluoroquinolones are going to be a problem with myasthenia gravis, the macrolide antibiotics, as you can see there, uh, the aminoglycosides. So there are a lot of antibiotics that we really have to um, be cautious about in prescribing to our myasthenic patients. So the poll question I have for you is, after hearing all that, which is the least likely cause of isolated adduction deficits? Is it myasthenia gravis, thyroid eye disease, cranial nerve 3 palsy, or internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So Cal and Joe, as this polling question is going, I believe it's going. Uh, I don't see the poll. Hmm. It popped up for a second and then it just went away. All right, let me uh, see. View results. Let me relaunch. Relaunch. There it is. All right. All right. So the question I have, since you guys do a lot of neuro, how many patients do you see, and Kel, I know you're specific, and Joe used to be specific and still more specific at your center for sight. Um, do you diagnose a year, I guess, with myasthenia coming in for an eye exam? I see patients coming in that have myasthenia and they want their eyes examined. Um, and I probably get maybe one say every 18 months where they come in with double vision. That's kind of like my N. How many are you kind of getting from eye exams that are myasthenia? It varies. Probably between, so there's three of us in my department. So I'd say probably between the three of us, hmm, 10 to 15. That's good. That's good. Joe, uh, is it in, I, your, I said, in your area? Oh yeah, I mean, I I I've seen more of my in the last two years than the last, than the last ten years. I'm not really sure why. Well, I, actually, but you I know what? Had... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, please. I've had a few people post COVID developed it. I just saw one mm -hmm. yesterday. His symptoms started right after COVID. Um, so is there a link? I don't know, but there's been several that I've seen. Um, they'd started to develop their symptoms right after they had about COVID. So I don't know if that yeah. could be why you've seen more. I, I don't know either, but I said yeah. the last two years, more than the last 10 years, just this week, I've had to order serology twice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, Kelly, you're right. You, you you look at it and you make a presumptive diagnosis. I had an older man who came in who had an, uh, a, an eye note. Uh, he had vasculopathic risk factors. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I might have convinced myself there was an abducting deficit. I might have been forcing that one. So I got the uh, I got the imaging and his imaging was fine and his quote unquote I know uh, resolved within a week. So at that point, I was thinking really we're looking at myasthenia. I ordered I ordered the testing. 
Uh, one of his tests, I forget which one it was, it might have been uh, it might have been binding, came back just under just just normal, just mm -hmm. under. So he's the kind of person that I'm going to kind of follow. He's a snowbird. He's flown up. I think he's flown up north. I expect probably by next year he might be seropositive or may have the diagnosis. Yes. I've had several where they were kind of borderline and repeated it again, and they were positive. So definitely um, something to keep on the radar. So a question I, came I, in. I, yeah, Joe. No, I, I, I find something kind of interesting in some of the neurologists in my area when they're treating with mestin and they say, use this dosage. And if it doesn't work, I use more. <laughs> it, it, it's almost like they're prescribing over the counter. A question right, came in, a direct message came in and said, would usage of a warm compress technically be contraindicated in patients with mycenia gravis induced ptosis? Would it increase the acetylcholinesterase activity? I mean, potentially, but thing is, if you're only holding it over the one eye that has the sty, um, it's going to be short lived, right? So, yes, they might have worse ptosis for a little bit of time, but then when the temperature of the lid comes back to normal, it's, the lid should go back to where it was. Um, so, it would probably be worth it if you were trying to treat something on an eyelid with warm compresses. If you say, all right, do this, but do it at a time where after it for the next, say, 15 minutes or so, you don't have to really have that eye open. Maybe do it pre yeah. sleep. You know, inter interestingly, the reason we use the ice pack test is we're inhibiting the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. There are two ways to inhibit an enzyme. You can super cool it or you can super heat it. So another way, quote unquote, to test would be to superheat it, but that's I'll not a very big practice yeah. builder. That is not a good <laughs> practice builder. Yeah, that would have to be a you're, little too hot, I think. Yeah, you're 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 you're, you're burning yeah. the patient. Exactly. That would work. That would work. So I think to answer the question, I don't think putting a warm compress on would accelerate. If we're talking superheat, I guess in a sense, to but I don't think it's going to accelerate. Um, so, you know, I think you're just kind of cooling. Right. So, and it you know, would so only I think it'd be, be okay. It would only be mm -hmm. the lid. It wouldn't, the main concern is you never want to do anything that's going to be causing like a myasthenic crisis. And that's why you have to be concerned which uh, medications you're prescribing. But just putting heat on an eyelid is, is not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Myasthenic crisis is going to be when there's bulbar involvement. So swallowing, breathing, et cetera, anything that could be life-threatening. Kelly, I got a quick a quick question in the in the in the transient intermittent double vision category. Uh, how often do you come across or get referred to sagging eye syndrome? A fair amount. Um, yeah. You know, it has to be in the differential a fair amount, I should say, right? Um, yeah. yeah I, I I probably see a couple a couple of cases a month. Yeah, and heavy eye too. A couple of cases. Yeah. And I, and I I went to the well once too often, but one of my sagging eye turned out to be myasthenia. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a comment here from Dr. Owens. It says I've had some success with uh, my myasthenia gravis ptosis without alignment defi deficits using uh, apneic. I can probably okay. second that too. I've had patients come in and using apneic to help them out, and uh, so good comment. And how often do you see my my booming or my booming gland? Ooh, my senior gravis patients, uh, and what is proper follow up? So I think we answered that. What's the, yeah. I guess the proper follow up if one of you guys want to take a crack at that? Well, it really depends. I mean, so a lot of these are going to be followed by neurology. So that's who's going to be dealing with the the medication dosage, et cetera. But you know, we have a role in in letting the neurologists know what's going on with the eye findings. And do we think that they're being adequately managed um, by their mestinon or whatever, based on how their ptosis is, based on how their eye alignment is? Uh, so in the beginning, the just like a lot of things, right? You're going to see them a little bit more often. Make sure that they're doing well and they can function well. And then as they get stable, you're going to be extending longer. Um, so it's really hard to say specifically, right? You know, yeah, you those patients, you know, those are going to be a little bit tricky. So yeah, based on the symptoms. Yeah, these are patients that 
once they're diagnosed and they're in the hands of a, a, a good neurologist, I do to see him for annual examinations, but it's easier to get in to see me urgently than the neurologist. Exactly. So my follow-ups tend to be PRN. They yes. come in, their, their diplopia is worse, but unfortunately, generally, uh, outside of a, of, a, of a patch, I can't do a much, much with them prismatically. Right. I just thought of something. We were talking about heat and whatnot. I remember a patient now that I had um, who came in, didn't have a history of myasthenia. We wound up saying this looks like myasthenia. Uh, but she was saying when she would take a hot shower, she would have difficulty breathing. Um, so, you know, the heat, et cetera, was causing an ex exacerbation of her symptoms. The shower just wasn't hot enough. There you right. go. <laughs> So, uh, Kel, we've kind of ended the poll question a while ago. Do you want to take care of the polling question? Sure. Oh, you mean the answer? I thought, yes. <laughs> which, which is the least likely cause of the isolated adduction deficits, as we said, thyroid eye disease. Uh, remember, that affects the bellies of the muscle. So, more likely, it's going to be the superior medial and inferior right thigh muscle, which would cause problems with up, down, and out, but not looking in. All right, ready to move on? Yeah, great discussion. All right, case number two. This is a 66-year-old man, and he complains of sudden onset blurry vision. It's been going on for four days. He notices what he describes as glare when he looks to the left, but he denies double vision. He said, do you see double? He says, no, it just is glary, it looks blurry. But his wife says that his left eye sometimes turns in. He went to the emergency room and at that point was told his blood pressure was very high, 190 over 90. And they said, well, that's the cause of your blur. And I don't know if they just said that's the cause of your blur or if they thought he had, say, a cranial nerve palsy that was vasculopathic. Um, I don't know specifically, but that's something we have to consider. He has a history of high blood pressure for 10 years and prostate cancer for which he was on chemo every three months, but he didn't have surgery or radiation. He was treated for his blood pressure and again, the chemo agent, which he did not know. He denied any eye pain, head pain, neurologic symptoms other than that, or any symptoms of giant cell arthritis. So he had no fever. He didn't talk about any jaw pain, any scalp tenderness, any new joint aches, et cetera. And you can see why his wife said that his eye turns in sometimes, when we had him look to the left and left gaze, the left eye did not go in. Uh, so he, now we're talking about an abduction deficit, so opposite of what we were seeing in the last case. And correspondingly, he's very ESO, and more so when he looks to the left. His afferent function, as you can see in that box, is, is normal. He has no proptosis, and his ocular health was unremarkable. So he has this abduction deficit, and when we ask him to do a cicade and quickly look to the left, it's slowed. So he, you know, when he's looking to the right, both eyes are to the right. When you say look to the left, of course the right eye does it perfectly. The left eye starts to go, but it's slower. And then it just stops kind of midline. So of course, if that's the case, we then want to do a forced duction test. to Say, is there something physically blocking this eye from moving like thyroid eye disease, right? Thyroid eye disease, Remember, we said that and myasthenia has to be on our differential list for any type of double vision. Now, for thyroid eye disease, would this be a possibility? Well, it's an abduction deficit, meaning it would have to be the medial rectus muscle that's enlarged. And that's the second most common muscle in thyroid eye disease. So that could be on the list here. So we're going to do a forced duction test. We're going to anesthetize the eye, get a cotton swab, put it on the... Uh, medial limbal area and slowly roll the eye over and see if it goes all the way to the left. If it doesn't, that tells us there's something restrictive there. That would be more indicative of thyroid eye disease <laughs> or a passing orbit. If we're able to move the eye over, it tells us there's nothing restrictive and it could be anything else that's affecting the eye. So it could be the neuromuscular junction like gravis, it could be the cranial nerve six, or it could be say the nerve six in the pond. So it could either be muscle junction, nerve, or brain. And this is a big, I have a lot to see here. But this is just all the things you have to think about when there's an abduction deficit, right? So there's a lot of things that it could be. It doesn't just mean it's a six nerve palsy, right? You can't just do that knee-jerk reaction. 
So we do a neurologic exam to try to sort out more so what this could be. His other cranial nerves were intact. Uh, there was no problem with motor sensory or coordination testing. So really we're just left with this isolated abduction deficit with a negative force duction test. So it seems to be a six nerve palsy. Now, I didn't put it all in here, but we did the apicularis oculi testing. We did the fatigue, we did the ice pack test and they were negative in this patient. So it wasn't, nothing was really jumping out as being, oh, my senior gravis here. But could this be a vasculopathic six nerve palsy? Sure. Blood pressure is documented to be very high, but we can't jump to that, okay? Uh, even though it seems likely his blood pressure is high in office, but what does he have? He has other health problems, specifically has prostate cancer. And when somebody has cancer, whatever their new onset neurologic deficit is, has to be considered secondary to the cancer until proven otherwise, okay? So we can never assume it's vasculopathic and wait the three months uh, for it to get better because of the cancer that had three months now to get worse spread. But it could also be a stroke of the pond, uh, or it could be giant cell arteritis. Mm -hmm. He's above the age of 50. So all those things are concerning enough that we can't just say, oh, this is vasculopathic and we can just wait for it to get better. So what things on here are we considering? There's a lot, but we're not thinking orbit because as we said, force suction test, we're not thinking myasthenia gravis or neuromuscular junction because we didn't see any other features of that. So could this be a six nerve palsy? Uh, if so, we were saying giant cell would be a likely one just based on stage, even though we had no other symptoms of it. But we have clivus kind of highlighted there too, because when we have to think about the course of cranial nerve six, so it starts in the low ponds. And then when it leaves and goes into the subarachnoid space, it travels, follows the clivus, which is that kind of uh, slope-like bone in the skull base. And it follows, goes up that before it then goes into the cavern sinus. So we have to consider something going wrong with the clivus. And knowing that he has prostate cancer, we know that that is something that does metastasize to bone. And then of course, if the problem is cranial nerve six in the brain, could this be a stroke? So what workup is needed? Well, we're going to have to do an MRI uh, with contrast. That's going to be better than a CAT scan, potentially to look for METs. Although if we're saying this is the clivus and we have to look at the bone, uh, perhaps a CAT scan would be better. But in this case, there's other things that we're considering such as a stroke, right? So MRI in general is going to be best to look for both of the things that we're considering. So we'd want to do an MRI of the brain and orbits with and without contrast. And then some labs. Initially, to start, we're just going to check the kidney functions to make sure he's safe to the contrast. And then do the labs for giant cell to make sure that's not an issue. So we're going to get a sed rate, C-reactive protein, and complete blood count uh, with a platelet count as well to make sure there's no indication of uh, inflammation. Now, that's going to be a little tough. I mean, we already know he has cancer. And cancer is something that can cause an elevated sed rate and C-reactive protein, right? Um, so we're doing that, but it's going to be difficult to interpret. So we just have to know that going in. But again, he has a cancer. And so I said, anytime somebody has a cancer, it's going to be thought to be the cause of their new onset neurologic deficit until proven otherwise, until we rule out that there's been a, a cancer a metastasis, right? So when we think about metastasis, because the prostate cancer itself would not be causing a six nerve palsy. Okay, localization wise, it's nowhere near there, but it could spread. And what could a cancer potentially spread to? It could spread to the brain, it could spread to the bone, the skull, specifically the skull base, the meninges, the orbit itself, or the lymph nodes. Other things, but they wouldn't be as applicable to us. So when we talk about metastases to the brain, what would we be thinking of? Well, where would the cancer start? So cancers that more likely spread to brain would be lung, breast, melanoma, lymphoma, renal cancers, colorectal cancers, osteosarcomas, and head and neck cancers. So you can see on there, prostate is not on that list. So prostate cancer can metastasize, of course, but it doesn't typically go to the brain. So we would be thinking less likely if this was a metastasis that it would be going to, for instance, the pons as the cause of his six nerve palsy. If we saw brain metastases, they would usually be at the junction of the gray and white matter, 
with some surrounding edema and they would enhance the contrast. We're seeing brain metastases, not just we, but in general, medicine is seeing brain metastases more commonly. Um, and it's actually one of the most common mass lesions in the brain. And this is because thankfully the treatments for cancer have gotten better. So people are living longer with the cancer. Um, so they're living long enough to get the metastases, first of all. But second of all, some of the treatments that are used for cancer, um, they can transiently weaken the blood-brain barrier and they can allow the cancer to spread through the blood-brain barrier. So we are definitely seeing an increase in brain metastases. Now, in terms of where brain metastases are typically seen, that depends on the blood supply. So they can be in the cerebrum, more likely because most of the blood supply to the brain goes to the cerebrum. A lesser amount to the cerebellum and uh, even lesser amount to the brainstem. And then the number of metastases can give you a sense of what type of cancer the, this was the primary cancer, right? Uh, so if it's an isolated metastases, it would be more likely thyroid, colon, or renal cancers. They usually only have one bed at a time, whereas melanoma, lung cancer, and breast cancer tend to have multiple areas of the brain that get metastases at the same time. Keeping in mind that these are hard to see on CAT scans, so if it looks like there's just an isolated one on a CAT scan, an MRI would, could show more. Now, now metastasis to bone uh, is definitely something that has to be considered as well. And the mo three most common cancers that metastasize to bone are prostate, breast, and lung. So definitely in our patient here who has prostate cancer, we have to really think about, could this be a bone metastasis? Uh, and what could be seen is a lytic lesion. A lytic lesion is just an area of bone destruction and there could be associated pain as well. So in terms of causing a neuroophthalmic disorder, specifically a six nerve palsy, as in our case, we'd have to be thinking about the skull base and specifically the cliver. So here is this patient's MRI scan. And this is of course the belly of the pond. So cranial nerve six comes out the low ponds and it travels in the subarachnoid space up the clivus to then go on either side because uh, both sixes are traveling up the clivus and then goes to the right one goes to the left of course to the cavernous sinus and you can see that the bony area of the clivus here just looks like it's enhancing keeping in mind that mri does not image bone so on an mri bone is dark but if you look at the skull here this is the scalp fat just to orient you this bright white and then you have this thin layer of black and then a thicker layer of gray and a thin layer of black. Now, MRI doesn't image bone, so you would think bone would be black, but really only the outsides. It's kind of like a sandwich. It's like a marrow sandwich because this inner gray area is the bone marrow. So that is showing up as gray in, in this, within this bone. So because of that, this is the bone marrow within the clivus over here and should have a uniform appearance, but you can see it does not have a uniform appearance at the top part and it is enhancing. And if you look at it on the axial section here, you can see that there's this mass that's been identified by the measurements here and by the arrow. Uh, and it's on the left side of the clivus and matches with the patient's left abduction deficit. So he, we did contact his oncologist and they um, changed his entire treatment for his prostate cancer but they also uh, we saw neurosurgery as well and radiation oncology, and they started doing radiation treatment to the clivus. Uh, and you can see he had a significant improvement in his uh, abduction ability. So the quicker these things can get identified, of course, the better prognosis for the patient. And so that's why I really caution against ever just jumping right to this is vasculopathic and we're just gonna wait out the you know, three months and see if it gets better. You know, I'll see you back in a few months. We'll see if it gets better. And if it doesn't, then we'll do some more testing because look what could happen, right? If we waste the time. And you might say, well, what if I have a patient that doesn't have cancer? Well, I've seen enough, my share of patients that have presented with an abduction deficit that did no history of cancer. And then the workup finds either a primary cancer or a metastatic lesion from a cancer, a primary cancer elsewhere in the body that they didn't even know they had. And the faster that it can be picked up, the better their prognosis is, not just for their 
vision, uh, but also for their life. So really, I, I caution against just assuming that things are vasculopathic without digging further. So the median age of cancer diagnosis is 66. He was 66 years old, exactly. Uh, but again, can't stress enough. You always have to consider cancer or metastasis as the etiology of a clinical presentation, especially if they have a history of cancer. Keeping in mind, though, sometimes the eye findings are the first manifestation of the underlying cancer, as I said. So now our poll. Prostate cancer is most likely to cause a sixth nerve palsy by metastasizing to which of the following? Pons cerebrum, clivus, or cavernous sinus? Which one would the prostate cancer metastasize to? Kelly, after you saw that patient and you started to, to uh, obtain the imaging, did you see him at any time proximal uh, shortly thereafter? If you can recall. Yeah, I'm trying to recall. I think I saw him shortly thereafter. Did he, did his, did his motility worsen? Oh, you mean immediately did it worsen? Um, I mean, it was already pretty much 0% mm -hmm. abduction, mm -hmm. so it didn't get worse. <laughs> See, what I, what I always consider when I, when I have a presumptive ischemic vascular palsy, mm -hmm. my approach is, and I tell the patients, it can get worse in a week. Oh, it, it, it can, can get be, worse. Vascular it, it can yeah. be it can be no better in two weeks. Mm -hmm. But I don't expect it to get worse for two weeks. Right. So something that is actually worsening over two weeks, that tells you you, you need to, to get involved and you don't yes. have to wait the uh the 12 weeks. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, so very good. The answer is clivus. Remember, prostate cancer metastasizes to bone, uh, doesn't metastasize to brain tissue. So very good. All right, moving on. Case number three, this is a 30-year-old woman with double vision. She noticed her double vision a month ago. It's constant horizontal double vision. She's getting an intermittent headache and some eye pain. She had an eye exam two weeks ago and, you know, Told that, well, maybe you have some monocular double vision. Um, I'm going to give you some glasses to correct the astigmatism. And she said, well, my vision's a little clearer, but I'm still having some double vision. Otherwise, she has some fatigue and she is anemic. And she said she's cold a lot, but that's really the only thing she could come up with in terms of symptoms. She's had a few pregnancies and severe anemia after the second child was born, requiring a transfusion. Uh, she doesn't use her iron as regularly as she should, as a lot of patients do not because of the constipation effects. Um, she's on uh, she was on Depo-Provera at that point, and she was noticing just occasional numbness, numbness in her left hand, but she said, I don't know, I think it's when I sleep on it. She was not really sure if it was real or not. And family history is remarkable only for lupus. She's 30, right? Uh, so no vasculopathic risk factors. So we have to think about what's going on. So let's take a look and see. She says horizontal. So is this going to be an abduction deficit or an adduction deficit? This is her just looking straight on. Her afferent function is fine. Her um, ocular health is good. There's no ptosis. There's no proptosis. We did a neurologic exam. And she just had some difficulty with tandem gait. And that is walking heel to toe, right? So mm -hmm. patients always call it the drunk test. You know, why are you thinking I'm drunk? So we're looking for some mild um, problems with heel to toe. And if we saw that, that would indicate ataxia. And she did have that. For being 30, she should be able to do heel to toe walking very easily. And she did have a little bit of difficulty. So mild ataxia. And we think about ataxia, we tend to think about cerebellum, cerebellum with peduncles. Um, so it's just something we have to kind of keep in the back of her mi our minds. But the other cranial nerves were intact and the sensory and the motor exams were normal as well. Let's look at her motilities though and see why is she complaining of double vision. So we look here and I know I'm sharing my screen, but I don't think there's anything in the way. Like, can you guys see all four of these pictures? Okay. Yes, we can. Because I have your pictures on top of them. 
<laughs> as long as you guys can see them, okay. So mm -hmm. we look here and in right and left gazes, looks pretty good, right? You know, so we have to keep in mind when a patient complains of double vision, and this could be what happened at her eye exam a few weeks prior where she was given glasses and thought, well, maybe this is monocular double vision. Because you say, all right, look up, down, left, right, your eyes look pretty aligned. Uh, I am getting that maybe you're only 20, 30 without glasses. I can make you 20, 20. That's probably what you're complaining about. So whenever somebody specifically says, I see double, we have to really make sure we do a cover test. And not just a cover test in primary gaze. We have to make sure that we do a cover test in other positions of gaze and well as well to see if their deviation is competent or not and see if it points to the pattern of a certain cranial nerve or to tell us what's going on. Because if you just look at this patient standing in front of her, you might say, well, your motilities look pretty mm -hmm. good. But also I'm gonna say that you really need to take the patient in full range of motion. And sometimes to do that, I can't just stand in front of the patient. I really have to kind of look around at the side and see what's going on. So we did our cover test and she was a significant amount of ESO and it increased in left gaze. And that makes you think of what? A left abduction deficit. Now, if I go back, you say, hmm, her abduction looks pretty similar in both eyes. This is where I say you really have to move around and look from the side. Because if you look from the side, you can see that even though straight on, she looks like she has good abducting ability. When you look from the side, you still see a lot of scleral show there. So really take the patient in full range of motion and look for that scleral show. Sometimes I'm kind of lifting the lateral canthus apart, seeing you know, how far is that eye going over and comparing it from one side to the other. And remember, when you really are looking for a ductional deficit, we should be doing ductions, not just versions. So it's hard to show that in pictures all the time. But if I were to cover this uh, right eye and just have the patient try to look with the left eye to see how far she should really get it. Because if she can see the target with the right eye, she has no reason to really try to force that eye over. And so now we're left with this same big, long differential for abduction deficit. Now, she's 30, so we can probably right off the bat say, all right, we're going to take off giant cell arteritis, and we can probably take off a few others as well. Um, so she had no, her neurologic exam was otherwise normal, so there was no cranial nerve 7 to tell us, oh, this is more likely to be pond. She had no problems with uh, motor or sensory testing. We did all of the Test for myasthenia gravis in office test. She had no fatigability. She had no positive ice pack test, no particular sacculi weakness. And her forced abduction test was negative. So we're not thinking of orbital mass or thyroid eye disease. But we've gotten a little smaller of a differential diagnosis. Uh, but we still have a lot of things on here that we have to consider. So remember, there was some mild ataxia. Now that would, as I said, localize to the cerebellum or the cerebellar peduncles. Um, so is this something that affects multiple parts of the brain? Hmm. So something to think about. Now, that could potentially be an infectious process, maybe something in the subarachnoid fluid, or it could be something in the brain like multiple sclerosis. So those are things that have to be considered. So we're going to get an MRI of the brain and orbits with and without contrast. Special attention to the low pond. Which is cranial nerve six is a consideration, as well as the cerebellum, the cerebellar peduncle. And then we want to rule out infectious, inflammatory, and autoimmune conditions with labs. So potential labs for diplopia. Now, I'm not saying we ordered all of these in this, this patient, and we didn't order the ones in black, the ones we talked about a little bit earlier already, the acetylcholine receptor antibodies, and we didn't do the thyroid studies because there was nothing pointing to those. We were focusing more on infectious, inflammatory, autoimmune conditions in this patient, as you see. So we get the labs, and all of the labs that we ordered were negative. There was no infectious, inflammatory, autoimmune component. But now we still have to see the MRI that we ordered. So we look at the MRI, and we can see these white matter changes. So here's the belly of the pons on this axial section. And we see these white matter changes here. We see multiple areas here in the ponds, in the cerebellar peduncle. 
Here are our lateral ventricles, You're just seeing a little bit of them on this cut, but we see these areas, these white matter changes that are perpendicular, okay? Uh, so perpendicular changes to the lateral ventricles, those are specifically known as Dawson's fingers, and they're very specific for multiple sclerosis because uh, it tends to affect the periventricular white matter. So definitely our concern now is MS. So we're gonna send the patient off to neurology for them to make a diagnosis. It's not something we can just look at an MRI. We can say it's likely MS because of these dots and fingers, but the MRI is not alone diagnostic. And this case is good because it reminds us with multiple sclerosis, we can't just think of the afferent visual system. Um, we also have to think about the efferent visual system. Well, everybody tends to always think about optic neuritis, which is great. We always have to think about that with MS. But keep in mind that MS can affect the efferent vision as well. Now, when we think about MS, it's a demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. We know the central nervous system is comprised of the optic nerve, the brain, and the spinal cord, right? Um, so it can't cause a six nerve palsy all the way along the course of six once it becomes the peripheral nervous system, which is as soon as it leaves the brain stem. But it, MS can cause a six nerve palsy when it, the six is traveling from its nucleus through the pons before it exits the pons. So it definitely is possible. So you could get a six nerve palsy from a central nervous system demyelinating disease, but you can also get a six nerve palsy from a peripheral nervous system demyelinating if it's affected after it leaves the pond. So things we have to ask about in the history, patients aren't gonna to think to tell their eye doctor some of these things because they don't have any idea how it's related. So some features of MS that we have to think about. Well, we know the optic neuritis, so we're gonna be, of course, checking for optic nerve dysfunction. And we know diplopia. Um, usually when we think of MS, we tend to think of brainstem motility features, right? We just said, right? So they can be cranial nerve palsies, but also skew deviation and internuclear ophthalmia, which we had discussed earlier. Uh, ataxia written down there at the bottom. So cerebellar features, the cerebellum can be involved. But then, of course, sensory motor and then bladder and bowel problems as well. So it's an important thing to ask patients. They don't think, tell their eye doctor that they're having incontinence. Um, so definitely questions that we really need to ask. And remember to test these things. Test the patient's strength. See if they're weak, or one side a little bit weaker than the other. Um, so if you start to test these sometimes on normal patients, you get to know what is normal, and then you know when something is abnormal. So what increases one's risk for MS? Uh, first 15 years of life, being further from the equator can do it. Vitamin D is a big one. Um, I think we're hearing that in a lot of conditions now, that they're linked to vitamin D. Uh, but definitely MS patients or MS patients, you're going to see that they're on uh, vitamin D treatment and because definitely lower levels of vitamin D are linked with increased risk of MS and worsening prognosis of MS once you have it. So definitely these patients need to be on their vitamin D and you need to ask them uh, when you see them, are you taking vitamin D? Were you told you need to take it? Because sometimes they don't know or forget about the importance mm -hmm. and they say, oh, somebody told me I should take that once. I didn't think it was really important. I thought it was just like a taking any vitamins, you could do it or you didn't have to do it. So we need to make sure we're educating the patients in that regard, making sure they know that smoking can also increase their risk or make it worse as well. And of course, always a question if there's a genetic component. But there are criteria. You know, I said you can't just look at the MRI and say this is definitely MS. So the latest uh, diagnostic criteria for MS are the McDonald's criteria and they were last revised in 2017. And in order to make a definitive diagnosis of MS, there needs to be shown to be dissemination in both time and space. So on looking at this MRI, we could see that there were multiple white matter regions. So that is dissemination in space. But the concern is if it was just one attack, if this only happened at one time, this may be something else. Um, uh, there's other types of demyelinating conditions that are more acute and can just happen more at, at a, a one time. So what else would need to be done in this patient to prove that this patient actually has MS? What would the neurologist do or look for? So we would need to show dissemination in time, and that could either by an be by an additional clinical attack that occurs down the road, or if they said, oh, well, in the past, I experienced an episode where my you know, arm went weak or my... Uh, 
um, leg got numb or something, if you can prove that something else happened. But usually it's gonna be something else that happens in the future after this point. Uh, but another thing that's very important is doing a spinal tap on these patients, which neurology will often do, because they're gonna look for what are called illegal clonal bands in the cerebrospinal fluid. Because if they are present, that can serve as the dissemination in time. So illegal clonal bands are something that you can hear. What they do is they take a sample of the CSF, but they also are gonna compare it to the blood and see where these banding patterns are. Um, and so you can see this normal patient on the left of this picture here is missing these bands kind of at the bottom of the CSF of the sample, whereas the abnormal patient with MS is having these bands at the bottom, this purple region here. And that's something that's very common that almost all 90 to 95% of MS patients will have this illegal, illegal clonal banding pattern. Now it's not specific for MS. It can happen in other conditions. Uh, other things that are affecting the CSF, such as like a neurosyphilis type thing. Uh, but if they're found, again, they can be used as that dissemination in time. So when we talk about uh, medications to treat MS, so there are so many and they're coming out every day. There's so many, we can't discuss them all in confines of this lecture. But we know there used to just be, when they first started, you know, it was just the infusions, right? And now we have orals, we have infusions. There's so many different things. Who knows what can happen in the future? Maybe one day we'll be able to have some reparative therapies, which would be great. But I do think we have to mention in this lecture those that have been associated with macular edema. Uh, just because as eye doctors, of course, we're the ones that need to look for this and monitor for it. And you may have neurologists that are specifically sending you patients that are on these medications to monitor them and make sure that they do not develop macular edema. So all of these four listed here uh, are all oral medications. And they're the ones that have been linked to macular edema. Now, I'm not saying all oral medications do, but this class, this class is a singacine one phosphate receptor modulator class, uh, all of that class specifically have the potential to be associated with macular edema. So the first uh, oral that of this class that was uh, developed was singolimod, uh, also going by the name of Golemia. So it, it documented that all patients on this medication have a, a mild increase in their macular volume or OCT. That doesn't mean that they all have macular edema, but if they do develop macular edema, usually discontinuing the medication typically resolves it. And if they are going to develop it, most of the time it will happen within the first year of treatment. So if they've been on the galenia over a year, it's unlikely that they're gonna to start to develop macular edema. It does appear though that the people that tend to get the macular edema are people that already have underlying problems such as diabetes, they've had prior uveitis, they've had pre-existing epiretinal membrane or other evidence of mature retinal traction. Uh, so those are the highest risk uh, for developing macular edema on this medication or this class of medication. But it's very, very low uh, likelihood, as you can see here. So at the approved dose, which is 0.5 milligrams per day, the rate of macular edema is only 0.2%. Something we need to know about, uh, we need to watch the patients when neurology sends them to us, uh, but the likelihood of them developing macular edema is low, higher with some of these other underlying conditions that we have to watch for. So what the American Academy of Ophthalmology, what has been the recommendation of how these patients should be monitored? Well, at baseline, um, they should have a complete ophthalmic exam. So of course, ophthalmoscopy and then an OCT. Uh, and then at three to four months after they started the medication, and then repeating six months later, and then once they've done that, you're essentially at a year, and at that point, just yearly exams after, okay? Uh, so if neurology sends a patient your way with MS, even if they don't have any ocular manifestations, just to be monitored, this is how often you should be testing them. Baseline, three to four months after, six months after that, and then annually. So poll question. The MS drugs that have the potential to cause macular edema are delivered by, administered by which route? Is it oral, 
injection or infusion. And while that's rolling in, Kelly, there was a uh, question or comment that came in. Uh, sorry if off topic, but comment about up knee captosis and myasthenia. Does it help post Botox ptosis? It does. Yes, I've had patients um, who come in with ptosis after Botox. And keeping in mind, after Botox, it's not immediate. Okay, and sometimes that can be a little confusing when you're trying to figure out why the patient has ptosis if you're not aware of the time frame. So some people think that, oh, well, it can't be from my injection of Botox because I got the Botox, you know, four weeks ago, but I only started to get this ptosis like a week or two ago, right? So usually it can take two weeks later uh, for it to happen. And it depends really how much they're rubbing their eye. If they rub their eyes a lot and they got the injection around their eye, uh, then you're more likely to get it because it's the Botox is spreading into some of the muscles, um, the levator, for instance. Uh, so I've had patients that have had this from Botox and they've tried Upneak and they definitely did notice an improvement. And we know it's something that's short-lived anyway. Within three months, the Botox is going to wear off. So definitely it's something that they could be on short term with Upneak and use and just make them aware that, okay, this is going to wear off on its own. But in the meantime, you can use this, this medication to definitely help you out. And there looks to be a part two or, or a continuation of this question. My patient had severe dry eye from lower lid ectropia and wanted tightening the lower lid against the eye to help with exposure SPK. Will anything help the lower lid temporarily until Botox wears off other than over-the-counter gel? Kelly so, or Greg? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, would, I would lid tape that. I, I was thinking take, the same thing. Yeah, I would take some... Uh, you know, transport tape and, you know, almost kind of doing like a lateral tarsorophy, um, you know, tighten it up and bring it in uh, until, you know, until uh, the Botox wore off. Good question. Mm -hmm. All right. So the MS Hold on. There's a, let's see here real quick. It's a private. Let me see. I actually did hit escape. Okay. Nothing to worry about. Um, okay. I'll take care of it. Okay. All right, so the MS drugs that have the potential to cause macular edema are administered orally. Very good. All right, moving on here, case number four. This is a 28-year-old woman, and she comes in saying that two weeks ago, she noticed blurry vision in the left eye. It's not gotten any better, blur is persisting. There's no pain in the left eye. No pain when she moves the eye. Uh, but three days prior, she noticed pain when she moved the eye in the other eye, in the right eye. And then just yesterday, she noticed decreased vision in the right eye. Okay, so it's now there's a problem with both eyes. Two weeks ago, the vision was blurry in the left eye. She just said, oh, I'm going to wait it out, see, it'll get better. Then three days ago, she started having pain in the right eye when she moved it. And then yesterday, she noticed she couldn't see inferiorly in the right eye. And now she's saying, oh, I got to come in and figure out what's going on. We ask about any other type of symptoms. And because, you know, she has pain when she moved her eye. So, of course, you're thinking optic neuritis. And we just kind of went through a lot with MS. We want to ask about all these other potential symptoms. And she said, well, yeah, I'm having some weakness and tingling in my left thigh. It kind of comes and goes, but it's happened you know, on and off over the past few years. And she was evaluated for it. Somebody said, well, it seems to be sciatica. And she was overweight. And somebody said, well, it's related to being overweight. You need to lose weight. And your, your thigh will feel better. And she lost 30 pounds, but the symptoms did not go away. Otherwise, health history is remarkable just for asthma. And she's medicated in that regard. As you can see, her ocular health is previously unremarkable, mm -hmm. as is her social history. So we take a look at her here. And uh, you can see. She has reduced color vision in the left eye. I need to move this so I can see what the VA is. And uh, there we go. So the VA is reduced in the left eye to 2040, and it's 2025 in the right eye. Color vision is a little bit reduced in the left eye as well at 10 out of 14. 
but you can see the field defect, inferiorly, as she said, that's in the right eye. There's something going on here in both eyes. By the time I saw her, she was referred to me, so she was already dilated, so I didn't get to see if she had an APD in the which eye. In terms of her reduced brightness sense and red desaturation, she says that it's more reduced in the left eye, even though but just looking at the field, it seems like the right eye is going to be worse, right? Her motilities were fine in this case. So there's no abduction deficit, adduction deficit. Everything is good in that regard. Her slit lamp exam is normal. Sonometry is okay. Blood pressure is okay. But we look at her nerves here. What do we see? Remember, she said the left eye started to get blurry, she thinks, a few weeks ago. And if we look at that, that looks maybe like it's a little pale, right? Pallor can take a little while to develop, usually about a month or so, give or take. So she's saying two weeks, maybe it was a little longer than that. And then her right eye, it's the one she's having pain on eye movements, started about three days ago. And then her vision started to get reduced in terms of her field just yesterday. And if we look at it, we see some indistinct margins, right? Where there's some elevation and there's obvious patent lines. Now, when we think of patent lines, first thing we probably think about, patent lines or peripapillary wrinkles, which we call them, first thing we probably think about is papilledema. A papilledema is a bilateral disc edema. Hmm. So, but if she already has some pallor in the one eye, do we have to be concerned about maybe there's like a Faulkner Kennedy syndrome going on here, something to consider? Uh, but that that left optic nerve still has neuroretinal rim tissue. It's a it's a little pale, yeah, but it's not completely pale. So there's still nerve fibers there to swell. Um, so we would think that if it was a papilledema, that I would start to be showing some of these as well, and it, it's not. So this seems to be more of a unilateral disc edema in the right eye uh, and some pallor in the left. So here, here is her OCT confirming the swelling or the edema that we saw in the right eye, and it is superior inferiorly and nasally elevated there in the uh, retinal nerve fiber there, as you can see. The left eye, as we say, looks a bit pale. It was more so pale temporally, and we are seeing some thinning of the temporal uh, RNFL going along with that. So the differential at this point is, okay, well, it seems like she has active optic neuritis in the right eye. Remember, she reported pain on eye movements started three days ago. And with optic neuritis, it is typical for the pain on eye movements to start before the vision loss. It can start a few days prior. So that's not uncommon for that to happen. You wanna keep that in mind. If someone comes into you complaining of pain on eye movements, but you do their exam and their efferent function is completely normal, their field is normal, um, you have to think about, could this be that's just the starting process of inflammation of the optic nerve? Remember the optic nerve, uh, and the extracular muscles share a common sheath, specifically the medial rectus muscle. Uh, so something to keep in mind, and you might want to then say, come back in a few days and let's recheck your vision to see if this really is um, the start of optic neuritis. And then, of course, did she have an optic neuropathy in the left eye as well? So when we put these together, is this a demyelinating is this MS again, just an afferent presentation? It's something that has to be considered. So we're gonna get a workup, right? We're gonna get the MRI with brain, the brain orbits with contrast like we did in the last case to see are there any of these white matter lesions. Now, what else? Are we gonna get labs? Yes. So optic neuritis, even though there tends to be the knee jerk reaction, okay, if there's optic neuritis, MS. MS is a cause of optic neuritis, but it's not the only cause of optic neuritis. So we have to keep in mind that infectious, inflammatory, autoimmune processes can cause an optic neuritis as well. And those need to be ruled out uh, before calling something multiple sclerosis related optic neuritis. And then of course, if we're talking about demyelinating disease, remember that affects the central nervous system, which is the optic nerve, the brain, and the spinal cord. So could this patient need an MRI of the spine as well? And those diagnoses are being considered, then the answer is gonna be yes. And then potentially lumbar puncture as well, because we had mentioned the importance of illegal colon banding patterns. 
So those things all have to be considered. So she did have the MRI of the brain in orbits and there was some mild enhancement of the posterior right optic nerve. So if you look at this middle picture, the coronal section here, this is an MRI, T1 weighted MRI with contrast. And if you look at the left orbit, this is kind of the posterior part of the, the globe on the left side, we see the extraocular muscles, which normally with contrast are bright, as you can see here on this axial section. That doesn't mean there's anything abnormal with them. They just always get bright with contrast but we don't see anything bright in the center of the orbit. Whereas on the right side, we see the extraocular muscles surrounding the posterior part of the orbit here, but we see this bright enhancing circle in the center and that's the optic nerve in the area of optic neuritis. And if we kind of look at this axial section, if I make a line here like that, that would be the cross section that was taken for the coronal. And right here is where we have this enhancement of the posterior part of the right optic nerve. Now, when we looked at the rest of the brain, this is just one representative picture, but all of them looked similar in that there really was no other white matter lesions. There was nothing periventricular, as we can see here. There was nothing, you know, in the brain stem or like the last case or anywhere, the rest of the brain looked good. So you'd have to think about, is this like a clinically isolated syndrome where it's just an optic neuritis or potentially is this something else? And this is why now the spine needs to be looked at because there's no other lesions, just optic nerve that could be clinically isolated syndrome, but we now need to look at the spine to see, is there any white matter or any enhancement of the spine? So when MRI spine was done at the level of C3, cervical level, um, there was a lesion of the spine. So the patient was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis by neurology. And this case is a bit older. Um, and we have to keep in mind that there are other demyelinating conditions besides multiple sclerosis. They're now fairly common to be tested for and considered. But back when I saw this patient, they weren't as commonly thought of. So we have to keep that in mind. So the patient returns a month later and says, well, I was on the steroids initially because she got IV steroid treatment for her optic neuritis. Because we usually want to do that within the first you know, eight days or so, get their work up, get them on IV steroids, get their vision better. And she did that, her vision got, well, she said the eye pain, I should say, got better on the steroids, but now that she's off the steroids, the eye pain has returned. Her headaches are getting worse and she's still having these uh, paresthesias in her leg. And she said they were also better when she was on steroids. Her vision has improved a bit in the left. Remember it was 2040, uh, now it's 2025, but look at her field in the right. It looks the same. No better, that's for sure. And now she has an equivocal APD. And just looking at the field, just say, oh, the APD is going to be in the right eye, but it's actually in the left because you know, that one has had past damage as well. Motility still remain normal. Now, if somebody has multiple sclerosis and optic neuritis associated with it, we know from the optic neuritis treatment trial that majority of the patients get better. They get most of them get 2020 vision, 2020, 2025. Um, I mean, you say, well, her vision is 2025, right? But it's not just the visual acuity, it's the visual field as well. Patient who has this fairly dense inferior altitudinal defect, that should have some improvement over the month time. And it's not. So we really have to have pause when there's a definition of MS and we're still seeing a significant visual field defect. We have to think, is this really MS? People with MS get better. It's Most of the time it's relaxing, remitting, right? So it, you have something, it flares up, it gets better, then something else flares up or it flares up again, but she never is getting better. So because the vision didn't improve, and remember there was spine improvement, but no, I mean, spine involvement, but no brain involvement. But we had to consider some tests that weren't initially done. And the, as I said, there's some other central nervous system demyelinating conditions that can cause optic neuritis that we have to think about. But way back when I started practicing, we didn't know about both of these because they didn't exist. By the time I saw this patient, 
Uh, we didn't know about MOGAD yet, which is myelin a green growth endocyte growth protein associated disease, but we did know about NMO, which is neuromyelitis So because when I saw her in follow-up, we noticed that she didn't get better from a visual standpoint. So we as eye doctors are able to have that information and the neurologists don't really have that as well because they don't see the visual fields for the most part. So we're able to say, oh, we're not, we're not really you know, on board that this is definitely MS. I think we need to get a little bit more testing. We need to rule out NMO. So she had the NMO antibody testing as well as some other testing. And this is talk a little bit about these three conditions. So we have MS, Everybody's probably familiar with multiple sclerosis, maybe not as familiar with the other two, NMO, which is neuromyelitis optica, and MOGAD, which is myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein associated disease. So all of these are central nervous system myelinating conditions, all have some type of autoimmune component and all can affect the optic nerve and cause optic neuritis. And we really have to be able to differentiate among them because the treatments differ to the point where if somebody really has say NMO, uh, and they're treated with MS medications, it can make the NMO worse. So we really need to make sure that the patient is being treated with the right medication. And you might say, well, that's neurology's department. That's not my department. But it's oftentimes the eye findings and the specific features of the optic neuritis that help us distinguish between them. So neurology wants our help to try to sort out, is this MS, is this NMO, or is this MOGAD? And thankfully now we have a blood tests that can be done for these. But just like with myasthenia gravis, they might not always be seropositive initially. So what we can tell neurology about the eye findings can be very helpful. So in our patient, we did more testing and the NMO antibody was positive, but she also had a positive ANA and positive Sjogren's antibody. So is this just the, the myelinating disease that's causing her problem, or does she have an overlying component of a rheumatologic condition as well? So I wanted to just go over some of the differences between MS, NMOSD, and uh, MOGAD. And you might say, well, what's NMOSD? You've been just talking about NMO, what's the SD stand for? Well, it's a spectrum of diseases. So it's neuromyelitis optica spectrum because there's not just one, there can be some uh, very presentation, so it's, it's more of a spectrum now. But there's still no specific blood tests for MS, unfortunately, hopefully at some point there can be. But for NMO, we know that it affects the aquaporin-4 uh, in the nerve. Uh, so we're gonna get an aquaporin-4 IgG, uh, antibody test, okay? It's a cell-based assay that should be obtained. And then for MOGAD, there's an anti-MOG antibody. Again, it should be a cell-based assay. Uh, and then the question is how, how are these diagnosed or what workup is needed? Well, with MS, we've already talked about, we need to rule out infectious inflammatory autoimmune conditions. And you can see the labs listed there. Those things still need to be ruled out before making a diagnosis of MMO and MOGAD. And as our patient showed, you can have both a demyelinating condition and some of these other um, uh, rheumatologic conditions or um, infectious conditions as well. So in terms of the NMO and the MOGAD, if what's in yellow, those antibodies, if they come out positive, uh, that definitely plays into whether or not they have NMO or MOGAD. Uh, but they still have to meet criteria. So just like with MS, we have the McDonald criteria. There are specific criteria for NMO and for MOGAD. And some of the other clin core clinical features with NMO, besides optic neuritis, uh, myelitis, which is inflammation of the spinal cord, um, brainstem syndrome, aeropostrema syndrome, and that's like brainstem as well, where patients can have uh, significant vomiting, for instance. Okay, so this tends to affect the optic nerves, the brainstem, and the spinal cord, not so much periventricular areas, okay? And then in terms of MOGAD, some of the other clinical features are also myelitis, so affecting the spinal cord, which MS can do so as well, um, but also brainstem defects, uh, corticoencephalitis, and seizures as well, potentially. 
But this is, I think, the most important part for us as eye doctors is knowing the features of the optic neuritis. And so one of the big differences we can see between MS optic neuritis and the other two is that MS optic neuritis tends to be unilateral, okay? And it's a short segment of the optic nerve that's affected. Whereas with NMOSD and MOGAD, it can be bilateral and a longer segment of the optic nerve. So if you ever see somebody who presents with a bilateral top type of an optic neuritis, in this case, the patient didn't present with both eyes at the same time, uh, but it was likely she had optic neuritis in the one first, maybe a month prior, and then followed shortly thereafter by the second eye. So when it starts to be bilateral, we have to think about that. Now, of course, you can have somebody that has a unilateral optic neuritis in MS, and subsequently the other eye becomes affected too. Um, so it's not gonna be definitive, but surely if it's bilateral happening at the same time, you're more likely thinking one of the other demyelinating conditions of MMO and MOGAD. In terms of the visual prognosis, we've already said with MS, it should be good. It can be a little variable, but we should expect that field to improve. We should expect the VA to get to be very good. Uh, and the fact that hers did not get better in the field specifically, that poor prognosis we can see falls under the NMO SD category and she was ultimately diagnosed with NMO. MOGAD, um, it's a bilateral, but more of a good prognosis. They should um, improve, okay? So if we use the kind of two areas there in the yellow as a help for us, definitely it, it could be a good thing in talking with our neurologist colleagues Saying, or if they're having both eyes affected with an optic neuritis, I think we really have to look into MO, and MOGAD, or when you see them on follow-up, if they have poor um, improvement. You know, if you've seen them for a few months and their vision is not getting better despite being on steroids, et cetera, then you really have to get the patient tested for MS, I'm sorry, for NMO and, and see if that's what's going on. I had mentioned that the treatment differs. So with multiple sclerosis, there's a lot of meds now, as we've mentioned, but they are immunomodulators. Whereas with NMOSD and MOGAD, it's more of a, an immunosuppressant type of medication that they're gonna be on. But all three of them, for the initial optic neuritis, they would be treated still with IV steroids. Okay, so that is the treatment for any of the optic neuritis once you roll out an infectious process. Uh, but then after the initial IV treatment, the, the treatment for the underlying disease does differ. So the patient was started on uh, an immunosuppressant um, and then was actually added another one. And then there was some improvement in the visual field in the right eye. And you can see the swelling starting to go down as well. And again, not perfect yet, but you know, by five weeks later, we're now starting to see improvement. So there was no improvement initially with the treatment for MS and the steroids. But once she was put on immunosuppressants, we started to see improvement there. So very important to distinguish between NF, uh, sorry, MS and neuromyelitis optica. As I mentioned- and Interestingly, <laughs> yes. if you go back to, go back, Kelly. Which, where? If you notice, yeah, the uh, the left eye is getting worse. Yes. We look at, at, the, at the structure. Yes, and that, that brings up a good point. With any of the demyelinating conditions, you can have subclinical worsening. So, that's why you know any of your, your neurology colleagues are maybe sending you patients with optic neuritis with NMO, uh, MOGAD just to get OCTs because they want to monitor this. It's it's a way to be looking without doing constant MRIs to see is the treatment they're on adequately controlling the um, the loss of axons. So, and this, and this is the reason that neurology groups are actually buying OCTs. Yes. And, and they're, they're advertising, they have an OCT. The only thing is they don't know how to interpret them. Right. And that's why they still rely on us to do that. Uh, and so, yeah, I co-manage a lot of demyelinating patients with neurologists, and they look to us to tell them, is the patients, I mean, short of them not having any other flare-ups in any other part of their body, but they look to us to say the patient's not having any flare-ups, um, but sometimes I say, well, yeah, they're not having any flare-ups. And even though their visual field and their 
visual acuity and color vision are normal, but I'm watching their OCT over time and I'm seeing mm -hmm. changes in their RNFL. It's thinning gradually every time I see them and their ganglion cell is thinning every time I see them. Then they, mm -hmm. they take that information and they use it to change their treatment plan. So it, it really, we do really play a big part in managing these patients, whether or not they start out with eye findings or not, solely because we can watch where else can you see what's happening to you know the axon and watch it over time? And it's yeah. really not just these patients, but oh, no. you know, it's it's all these other patients. I mean, yes, neuro ophthalmologists dig on this. General ophthalmologists hate this. They don't want to do any of this. Retinal specialists will do it because it defaults to them. But we're not going to be the ones that really have to order all the tests. We, you know, it, it helps to work with the neurologist, work with the rheumatologist, and work with the primary care physician yeah. and the and the ER physician because they don't have access to this and they don't have the ability to tease it out. But they sure as heck appreciate it when we tell them yes. what we, you know, what's going on with patients. Definitely, and as you mentioned, it's not just these patients. It's not just demyelinating disease patients is any type of neurodegenerative disease. So you can have the neurodegenerative dementias, so the Alzheimer's, Parkinson's patients, et cetera, and, and watching to see, you know, how are they managed? Now there's not as many treatment options, especially for Alzheimer's, although one was approved this week. Um, but, you know, definitely neurologists are always looking for us to say, how are they doing in terms of their ganglion cell and their, their RNFL? Uh, are they staying stable or is there subclinical change? And so it's very and they, important. And they're not, and a, and a neurologist is not going to be looking in the eye and, and picking up disc edema. No. So it's definitely something where, as I said, we play a role in co-managing co these patients. And again, I had mentioned that the treatment does uh, vary, but for all of them, the initial treatment is IV prednisolone. Uh, but for acute attacks, for NMO um, and MOGAD, and now I have ADEM in here as well, which is just another um, uh, central nervous system demyelinating condition, but it's more of an acute uh, thing but they could have a plasma exchange that's used as well, where they filter out the uh, antibody. But I just wanted to go on to the diagnostic criteria a little bit for MOGAD because it's new, it was just made in 2023. Um, and so, as I said, it was just published, but something that we really need to think about, they have to have you know at least one of these clinical supporting features and think about it, what is it? It's bilateral simultaneous optic neuritis. So that's gonna be our role to really say that's what this is. Because as you said, the neurologists aren't gonna be looking in the eye. They might say, yeah, the patient has reduced vision or they complain on PLI movements, but it's putting it all together, looking to see, do all these things point to optic neuritis or do they have something else? So they just so happen to have some other cause of vision loss, right? Refractive versus everything that we're gonna to have to rule out. So we really need to, uh, determine, is it truly an optic neuritis? So again, the key points, if it's bilateral or if it's the optic chiasm affected, we really have to think something other than MS, so NMO or MOGA. So the poll question here is bilateral optic neuritis is least likely to be secondary to which of the following demyelinating diseases? So bilateral is least likely from, is it multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, or Oh, I think that when we uh, when we finish this poll, we're probably going to uh, have to land it because we're about, right, right out about our time, Kelly. Okay. Uh, Greg, looks we have we have. Let's relaunch the poll. What am I doing? Did you end the last one? Oh, then again, you know, Zoom is quirky. Yep. I don't know what it's doing. There it's up. It's now. up and running. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Zoom is pretty quirky sometimes. So bilateral optic neuritis least likely to be secondary to which demyelinating disease? MS, NMO, or MOGAD?
All right, very good. Least likely to be related to MS. If you see a bilateral optic neuritis, you really have to think about another demyelinating condition. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much, Kelly. I don't thank know how much more you had left. Maybe, maybe there'll be a part three. <laughs> Kelly, I think you do that on purpose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always put an extra one because in case I go too fast. So no, this was um, where I pretty much planned to end, but I added another one. Just one more case in there, just in case I had some extra time. Yeah, we're all the same way. No, nobody wants to... nobody wants dead air. Right. There was one other part after this I was going to talk about the importance of the OCP and we spoke for bringing that up a little early, so we are going to do it. So that's great. So I wanted to make sure we talked about that. Well, Kelly, you're getting your virtual round of applause. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to land, land it, as Joe mentioned here, and say thank you for doing neuroophthalmic okay. disease cases part two. This was a synchronous virtual course. Looks like we've got all the questions answered. And uh, thank everyone for attending uh, this course. Thank you, everyone.